every Saturday morning and every Saturday night, I do two things here at Times Square Church. In the morning, I pray over every seat that you're sitting in, whether you're in the choir. I pray over every instrument. I pray over every spot of this stage. I pray over the sound people. I pray over every, everything. The balcony, I start right there in that corner, right over there where you guys are waving your hands. I start in those seats so you get it fresh every single Saturday morning over there. So if you don't feel something, God help you. <laughs> then every Saturday night, I come down here and I pray for protection over this. I go back home, whatever we need to do with our family or study or whatever it is, and then I go back home and I come back here as I did last night, and I pray two things. I pray over every corner of this, and I, at this place, and I say, God, station angels on each corner of this place. And this is what I pray. I said, station an angel at 52nd and Broadway, 51st and Broadway, 8th and, and 52nd, and 8th and 51st. Set your angels a guard over this place. And then the second thing that I do is I pray over every one of our entry points into this place, starting where our children walk in, to where you walk in, to where our, our stage and choir walk in, and this is what I pray. I say, I plead the blood of Jesus over this place, that no wicked thing can ever walk into this place, that, Father, you would protect this house. You have put us here for a reason. And I pray the blood of Jesus over, over every doorpost. What am I doing and why am I doing this? I think we understand the angelic protection, but I'm not sure we understand the, the, the power of the blood of Jesus and what that affords us as believers. Dr. R.T. Kendall, who will be here preaching Tuesday night, has prayed over me many times and has said these words as he's getting to the end of his prayer. Let me read them to you in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Now here it comes. Listen to these words. Who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. There must be having some technical I issues, so we'll just keep going. That's, we're, we're not adherent to technology. We'll let God's Holy Spirit just begin to speak it. So get your phones and ready to, to get ready for looking at these scriptures. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, that you're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And then he declares these words. Listen to him. He says that you are a people that are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Here is what I believe that the Apostle Peter was teaching us, that there was something that happened in them that was the atoning work of salvation, that they were redeemed by the blood of Jesus, but he was also saying, in my opinion, something bigger and something further. He was saying that something was going to be happening to them and they needed to be ready. The blood has saved you, but now... We need for you to understand we want the blood to also protect you. Peter spoke this over these believers because something very dangerous was looming and on its way. They needed to know how important this is, that they are saved, but they're also protected. They're saved and they're also protected. Just as there is something I believe that as Peter was warning them about something that was looming and coming, I believe we're faced with the same things today. That there is something in looming that is coming. I know I can speak for our nation that something dangerous is coming and something, and, and we're seeing not only an infiltration in the culture, but I think there's more that is coming our way and we need the blood of Jesus more than ever. Not just simply, please don't stop and go, thank God he has saved me. We need the blood of Jesus to help us in every aspect of life. There is the blood of Jesus for the atonement, but there is the blood of Jesus for protection. Let me explain why I think this. Less than a year after Peter wrote this epistle, many believe between nine 
and 10 months, the Roman emperor Nero would burn Rome so he could rebuild the city for his own glory. When the people turned against Nero and started to think that he was, that, that they started to realize he was the one that did it, he moved their attention, which started the first wave of persecution towards the blaming the Christians as scapegoats. There was no doubt about it. Nero hated the Christians, and this became his excuse for the mass execution that would be beginning to come. That the, what Peter was, I, I believe, doing was saying that same sprinkling of the blood that saved you, that you were saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, you are going to need it because there is a battle that's coming, that you're going to need that protection. It was, the, it was the, the church historian Eusebius who basically said that the total number of Christians who lost their lives when those persecutions started was so is unknown. He said it was countless numbers and myriads that were protected because God knew something was coming. God knew that they needed protection. God knew what was taking place. Now, folks, I want you to hear me for just a moment on this before we dive into this in the Old Testament. We are at that place even today. People are afraid to talk about the truth today in public for fear of retaliation on their job, on their campus. They're afraid that they are going to get labeled, fired, removed, And it's amazing. I have watched it, that you talk about biblical values, and I've watched people lower their voice and look around them because they they don't know who's listening to what they're saying. And people are afraid today. Christians are afraid today. And I want you to understand, if there is ever a day we need to know the power of the blood of Jesus, it is today. That's why it was given to the Apostle Peter to speak this. I've seen the power of the blood of Jesus. When I started in ministry in Detroit, and we would see the the demonic forces and, and possession come against us, there were two powerful things that I've learned in the beginning of ministry. These two things, I've learned the power, there's power in the name of Jesus, and there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, for some of you, This is going to be brand new, whether you're a new Christian or whether you're just visiting today and say, I don't know about any of this. Bear with me. You're going to see how important this is, and you'll see it from a Bible standpoint. But what this does also when you start speaking about the blood of Jesus, the emerging church gets upset with this because they don't like us to be speaking about these things. But once again, we don't care. So in the name of the name of Jesus brings deliverance. It's also the blood of Jesus that brings protection. And people are afraid to speak like this. And that is why the church is being invaded by false doctrines and false teachers. The blood of Jesus is too much now for the church. So we retreat to nonsense. And we think that this is the way that we're supposed to do it. I was just sent information of churches in the Midwest that what they're doing now is they're blessing motorcycles in church. Bless your bike Sunday. Bring your Harley Davidson to the church and the pastor will bless it along with his own Harley Davidson. Let let me just tell you this. I don't need my Harley Davidson. Okay, I don't even have a car. So I don't even need that. I need, we do need the subways blessed. And I'll tell you that. And the, and the yellow cat. How many New Yorkers would say, absolutely, we need a miracle. And especially on the B and the D. We need a miracle on the B and the D. I'm just telling you. I don't need the blessing on a motorcycle or a car. We don't need that, folks. We need the blood of Jesus and the, and the presence over our lives. We don't need to come up with gimmicks and create a circus of what this is just to draw people in. I'm telling you, I want you to listen to me. Leaders, I want you to listen to me because the church is selling its birthright today like Esau sold his own in the book of Genesis. When Esau was deceived and sold his birthright is because he was famished and hungry. And we're watching religious leaders hungry for numbers and clicks followers, subscribers, and notoriety, and they sell themselves for this. What did, actual, what did Esau actually sell when he gave away his birthright? Listen carefully. 
He was selling his voice to the next generation. The birthright meant you were the patriarch and the voice for the upcoming generation. And I'm telling you as leaders, the church is selling its birthright for bike blessings and secular music to bring in people and showmanship and a stage. And in the midst of it, you thinking you're gaining your voice, you're losing your voice. You're losing an influence because God is beginning to show the difference between light and darkness, the clean and the unclean. And that's why I'm telling you, as long as I can stand here and have the strength of God, I want the world to hear it. I believe in the power of the name of Jesus. I believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that I don't need a bike blessed, a car blessed, a pet blessed. I just need the presence of God and the Holy Spirit to come. It's all gimmicks. It's smoke and mirrors who are afraid. It is still the name of Jesus. It is still the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what God has called us to. I'm not angry. <laughs> Pleading the blood of Jesus in prayer is asking for protection. It is God, when God does that, it's, we're asking God to put a barrier that cannot be crossed by Satan. When we plead the blood, we're saying, and you'll see it in the Old Testament, it's a, bar it's a blood barrier that says the enemy can't cross. Folks, I I'm telling you, you can, all the other stuff, the enemy will go right after it. The enemy can't deal with the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. That's why he's removing it from the pulpits. That's why he's removing it from the churches. Please don't leave and walk out on me until you get to the end. Then you can leave us. But just listen for a second. Because I believe it's one of the benefits that happens is, is the protection. The blood of Jesus, get this now. When we plead the blood, it is a judicial weapon. And it's best to explain when we say pleading the blood. Because, because it becomes judicial, as this, this concept... As, as this word pleading is attached to it. What comes to mind today in, in today's judicial system, when we say plead in the court system, we say things like, I plead the what amendment? The fifth, you know it too easy. So it's just, <laughs> welcome to our church. When you plead the fifth, you're referring to a higher law. You're referring to the constitution. You're referring to the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that guarantees that an individual cannot be compelled to provide incriminating information. I plead the Fifth. You've just went to a higher law. No matter who's around you, when you plead the Fifth, there's nobody here that can deal with that higher law, the Constitution. You're appealing and going up higher. I asked an attorney in our church, I was texting him, and I said, you tell me, when, you, when as a lawyer... Pleading the fifth, pleading the blood, and, he, and the text was to your thought, pastor, of pleading the fifth. He says, pleading in that context obviously means declaring you are entitled to the protections and the benefits of the Constitution as a God-given right as a citizen. That's what happens when you plead the blood. What happens when you plead the blood means I can't protect myself so I'm appealing to something higher that can begin to stand in the way of what's coming at me. What I'm doing is, is I'm beginning to enter into the benefits of being a child of God. I'm entering into something that I didn't deserve, I couldn't get on my own, and appealing to a higher law. Here are what I've started to realize, and I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures. What does it mean to plead the blood of Jesus over someone over our homes, our children. What does it mean to do that? I see four things that it means that I want you to write down or take a picture on the screen. One, it means this, that we just said, I'm praying for protection. Number two, I'm believing for deliverance. Number three, and I'm gonna explain this to you, I'm asking for them to have a brand new start. And number four, I'm anticipating the day that they will tell their testimony of what the blood of Jesus has done inside of their lives. I'm gonna show this to you in just a moment. Number one, it means I'm praying for protection. 
I'm believing for deliverance. I'm asking God for a new start, and I'm anticipating the day that they will tell their testimony. To understand these benefits, you have to go back like the song you just sang to the olden days when we sang the blood prevails. I think pleading the blood, sprinkling the blood, like Peter said, on our situation, our homes, our lives, our children, our minds, and our family, that the power of the blood was realized on the night of the last plague in Egypt. Let me go to those olden days for a moment. Before the exodus of three million Jews, God was sending his final plague against Pharaoh who would not let God's people go. And it was on that final night that the blood broke everything. Listen to this. He, God says, I am going to go through the land of Egypt and on that night I will strike down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will, don't miss that part. Against all the gods of Egypt, I'm going to execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live that when I see the blood, hallelujah, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. It was, there, was, there was something spiritual about doing what God has asked them to do. I've always wondered this and, and, and asked this question as I've read the book of Exodus. If you know this will be the plague that will break the bondage, that will finally, Pharaoh will say, um, I'm going to release the people after all years of slavery. I kept asking this question as I was reading Exodus, then why, why wait till 10? Why wasn't 10 number one? Why would you go through nine other plagues? Just, just don't waste time. Just go, let's go right for the blood. That's all. I, I kept thinking that. It would have been so much easier. You save so much time if, they, if 10 was one. And God is delivering the children of Israel after 400 years of slavery it was this 10th plague when the death angel would go through Egypt, kill every firstborn, and only the doors that had the blood of the lamb would have the death angel pass over it. But I believe there had to be 10 plagues. The 10 plagues of Egypt from the book of Exodus, something was happening. The plagues not only decimated Egypt physically and economically, but more importantly, don't miss this, it decimated them spiritually. Because all the plagues targeted one or a combination of the Egyptian gods and goddesses. It was God going, I'm going to take them all out one by one. Yeah. Folks, I'm telling you, listen to this. I started, I'm going like, that's why there's 10. Listen to it. Why does God send these plagues? So there would be no debate who God is. Here it is. 7-3, but I'll cause Pharaoh to be stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. He says his stubbornness is what's going to begin to make 10 plagues come. Even then Pharaoh refused to listen to you, so I will crush Egypt with a series of disasters after which I'll lead the forces of Israel out with great acts of judgment. Here it comes. When I show the Egyptians my power and force them to let the Israelites go. Look at it. They will realize what? That I am the Lord. <laughs> Folks, God is making a statement here. That's what was happening. Some areas of Egypt had different names for, the, for their gods over things. So God goes, let me start with not only the waters, but I'm going to start with what many believe was the oldest known God in Egypt. Plague number one in Exodus chapter 7 verse 14 the water would be turned into blood. It was targeting the Egyptian god Hapi, who was god of the Nile and god of all the waters and was the oldest god in the, in the Egyptian mind. God goes, let me take him out first. Plague number two, the frogs. The frogs in the Egyptians was the, there was the, the, the frog was the goddess Hecht and she represented resurrection. And I can see God going, they haven't seen anything yet. Wait till, wait till they get to Easter in the New Testament. So let me take her out, number two, by just showing that I'm in charge of all these frogs. And the frogs that you thought were resurrection, you're going to get sick of them because they're going to be everywhere in your homes. 
Plagues three and four were lice and flies and gnats targeted the god Kafer, who is the god of the beetles and the flies. You can keep those gods. Plague number five, the death of livestock. That was important because livestock and cattle meant success and riches. It meant in that time it was a symbol of wealth. And God goes, you're not in charge of wealth. I'm in charge of everything that goes on here. And God says, I'll go ahead and go after that. Plague number six, the boils. God tar targeted um, Imenhotep, who was the physician god. He was the god of medicine. The priests who used to be in charge of healing people couldn't even heal anyone because they had boils on them. It was God announcing, you're not the healer. I'm the healer of every disease. Plague number seven, hail. This targeted the goddess Nut. What a great name. The goddess Nut that affected every plant, every tree, every living thing in Egypt. And God goes, I'm going to take everything out here to show you who is the one that put the seed in the ground from the very beginning in creation. Plague number eight, the locusts targeted the god Seth who was the god of crops. The locusts would have eaten every crop and vegetation and brought famine to the land. Plague number nine, darkness that would be felt. The targeted was the sun god, Ra, who they thought was the most powerful god. And all of a sudden, they, what they thought was God, Ra, who was in charge of bringing light every single day, God goes, in one moment, I'll turn it all dark. Because that's not a god in the sun. I created that sun. I'm the one who put that up there. And finally, plague number 10, God's finale, the target of the God Bess, who was the protector of children and the protector of the family. And God goes, and here's what's amazing. God begins to go, not only, I'll even give Egyptians a way out. He even said, anybody who puts the blood over their doorposts are gonna know what, 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 uh, what it means to be protected. But the Egyptians believed that all the pharaohs and their family were living incarnations of God. That's what they thought, that the child of Pharaoh was a God. Pharaoh was a God. They worshiped those individuals as God. And in one night, God said, I'm in charge of everything. You're not God, I'm God. And God told the Hebrews, put the blood of the lamb on their doors. And the Passover was born on the night of the angel of death came. That literally the word means to pass over the death angel. God was targeting the gods of Egypt. God was revealing the power of the blood of the lamb. He was showing them who is the real God. And the blood of the lamb was the finale of it all. To say what you thought was going to be some cheap thing that you were trying to get out and look at all these other things to look at. He said it always comes back to the simple blood of the lamb all times. Folks, that's it. Everybody else is trying to put everything else in its place. And it's the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, who will always distinguish himself as God. No matter who you are, no matter what you're faced with today, the blood will prevail. The blood speaks higher than anything you can go on. I remember David Wilkerson, the founder of Teen Challenge and the founder of Times Square Church, telling the story of that final night in, in Egypt when God was getting ready to perform that final, that final miracle, the plague, the death angel was to come. And it was right there that David Wilkerson said, he said, can you imagine what the households of that night were like. And Brother Dave, who we affectionately called, Brother D David Wilkerson, we affectionately called Brother Dave, said, can you imagine two homes next to each other? And one home, they put the blood of the lamb on it, and they're celebrating the Passover feast. And all of a sudden, the children are going, Father, we hear screams. What are we going to do? We're hearing the screams. What about our home? And the father looks at that boy and that little girl and says, we're okay, we're safe. We have the blood of Jesus over, we have the blood of the lamb over our doorpost. You can eat, you can walk, we are protected by the blood. The blood is over our doorpost. And then David Wilkerson said this, he said, but what about the next house next to them? And the children are looking, Father, we hear the screams. 
What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And the father, this father is different and says, I'm not sure. I put the blood over the doorpost, but I'm not sure if it's gonna work. All I know is we've never done anything like this before. We're brand new at this. And so we have the blood over it, but I don't know. Let's just pray that God keeps us during this. And then David Wilkerson would ask this question, which house was most protected? And he would say this, they're both protected. Because it's not your, it's not your doubts and it's not your faith. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that has set us free. It is the blood of Jesus. Oh, I'm telling you, I look at that, that gets me excited. You can sit there and think it's your education. You can think it's your PhD. You can think it's everything that you've done. I want the blood. I want the name of Jesus. I want all that God has for me. I'm not sitting here going, oh, I, my, my PhD, my math. You can have it. Give me the blood. Give me the blood over my children. Oh, it gets me excited. I get excited. I spit, I'll jump, I'll stand. I want Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sit down. All right. Some of you, you sit so sophisticated that you think to yourself, I'm in church. Of course we're in church. That's why we're excited. And you don't know what the power of the blood is because I'm telling you for some of us that have watched God's protection, I can't sit there. I watch his protection over my children, over my own lives. I've watched a death angel pass by us in Detroit, in New York, and it's only God that has done that. It's only God that has done it. Because God has taken out nine other of men's false gods to say, it's me, it's me, it's my blood. Before you trust in the Nile and the frogs and lice and the sun, you trust in me. we have to do this fast I think there's four things the blood of the lamb did for the people of God in Egypt that night and I think it still works for us today I think the blood prevails I think the first thing it did is that the blood of the lamb meant protection that's clear there are homes that had the blood on the doorposts or protected homes 1223 when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians He will see the blood on the top and the sides of the doorframe and he will pass over and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike down. Blood of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my apartment, I plead it over my children, I plead it, I plead it. And we need protection from the moment you get saved. No matter who you are, the enemy will come against you. I was reading The story of Martin Luther, the great reformer. The devil sought to discourage Martin Luther right in the hardest time of the Reformation by making him feel guilty of his past. And Luther wrote in his journal, he spoke about a visitation he had one night from the devil in the midst of of all that he was faced with the Reformation. And Satan was, he said, Satan was rehearsing a list of his sins of the past. And when the devil had finished telling him, you're this, you're this, you're this, Luther said, I looked at the devil and I said, think harder. You must have forgotten some of the sins of my past. And the devil, he said, gave me a list of more sins. And Luther said, I looked at the devil and I said, anything else? Is there anything else? And he said, when Satan was done listing the sins of Martin Luther, Luther said he looked at the enemy and he says, Satan, now write over this, write this over the list, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all of my sins. The blood of Jesus cleanses me. Number two, the blood of the lamb meant deliverance. This would be the last night of 400 years of chains. The blood of the lamb would break the shackles and they would be released 
to go into freedom. Verse 31, then he called from Moses and Aaron. This is Pharaoh that night. And he said, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and your sons of Israel. Go and worship the Lord as you said. Pharaoh just, at that moment, Pharaoh said, we've lost, God has won. And the devil will try to keep you in bondage to addictions, depression, and fear. But folks, we are a people that have been washed, sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, washed by the blood of Jesus. I was reading the story of the 14th century Robert Bruce of Scotland who was leading his men into battle to gain independence from England. And near the end of the conflict, the English wanted to capture Robert the Bruce and keep him from the, getting the Scottish crown. So they put out their bloodhounds on his trail. And when the hounds got close, Bruce could hear their barking. And his attendant said, we're done for. They're on our trail. They'll reveal your hiding place. And Bruce replied, it's all right. And then he headed down. This is what it said. He headed down for a stream that flowed through the forest. And it says he plunged in, waded upstream a short distance, and came out on the other side. And he wrote that within minutes, the hounds tracing our steps came to the bank and they could go no further. The English soldiers urged them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent away. And a short time later, the crown of Scotland rested on Robert the Bruce's head. And folks, what he said was, when we plunged into that river, the enemy that was after us to remove what was rightfully ours, lost the scent to get us. That's why I love that old hymn when it starts with these words. It goes, oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I'm so glad to have entered in there. Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. And then it says, glory to his name. But it's the second verse that gets me. He says, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Here it comes. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. <laughs> Folks, when we get saved, we plunge in. Folks, I'm telling you, the enemy is going to put you in bondage and the best place for him to lose the sin is plunge in to that blood, life-giving blood of Jesus Christ today. The blood of the lamb, number three, marked the beginning of a new life. This is what God said. 12.1, now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this month, this month, with the blood that has set you free, this month, shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year. He says, you mark your calendars that this was. You want to know what January 1 for them was? It's when the blood set us free. The blood was the beginning. It was a new beginning. It marked the beginning of life. The power of the blood turns the page on your past and moves you into a victorious future. That's what it does. When the great Methodist Evangelist John Wesley was returning from home from a service one night. He was robbed. The thief found his victim, John Wesley, to only have a little money. He's a pastor in some Christian literature. He got, a, he got a few coins and a track. And as the bandit was leaving, Wesley called out and said, Stop! I have some more to give you. And the robber was surprised. And, he, and, and the robber turned back and he said, My friend, you may live to regret this sort of life, and if you do, here's something to remember. And he looked at me and he goes, the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all your sin. The thief hurried away. Wesley prayed that his words might bear fruit. Listen to this. Years later, Wesley was greeting people after a Sunday service when this man approached him and was surprised to find out that that businessman was the thief that robbed him. And he looked at him and he said, Mr. Wesley, I owe it all to you, which was Wesley said. He says, oh, no, my friend, you don't owe it to me. You owe it to the blood of Jesus Christ that sets you free, that did this. That that man, when he heard those words, a new day was starting. A new beginning was starting. And fourthly, the blood of the lamb would be a testimony to tell. Verse 26 and 27 of that same chapter. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, spared our homes, and when he struck down the Egyptians, 
Then the people bowed and worshiped. He was saying, you're gonna have a story to tell and how God delivered you. That with the blood of Christ, listen to this, friends, it gives you a testimony to tell. It gives you a story to tell. The second largest Protestant denomination in America just approved lifestyles and things for their whole denomination, for ordinations and marriages. And, and, and all I thought about was this. This is the John Wesley that starts the Methodist movement. This is John Wesley who had a story to tell, had a businessman. And this is what I'm wondering. I'm, I kept thinking to myself, do you not believe that the blood of Jesus is enough to give you a new story? That that's what we're doing, folks. Churches and our government, they're approving sin because they don't believe the blood can give them a new story. Folks, I believe in new stories to tell. I believe that God. So when you don't believe in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, you just approve things that hold you bondage. But when you believe in the power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, I'm telling you, he gives you a story to tell. I have this crazy thought that I just wonder sometimes if they're in bondage for 400 years, the Israelites, because they thought in order to get free, we need an army and we need men and we need weapons. And God goes, you don't need an army. You don't need weapons. You just need my blood on one of these nights to set you free. It's God going, get a story to tell. The blood of Jesus gives you a new beginning. You don't have to sanction and approve sin. God wants to break the power of sin. He wants to set people free. Don't, don't live comfortably in sin when the Bible tells us he can break those chains. He can break those shackles and give you a brand new day. Don't walk out of here and patting yourself on the back going, I'm okay. When you know you're walking out in shackles and chains, I'm here to tell you, God can set you free today. He can set you free. Pleading the blood of Jesus is not some superstitious application of a magic formula. They're words for spiritual warfare. The power of the blood of Jesus is greater than my own energy, our own humanity. And it's greater than our adversary. It's the power that saves us, but it's also the power that protects us, delivers us, gives us new starts and powerful testimonies. When you plead the blood of Jesus, I think it's symbolic of what those Jewish homes have done. So let's close with this final verse, with the finale of the New Testament that brings us all the way to Revelation 4, as the 12, as the musicians come. Because the enemy seems to come with a force in these last days. It's Revelation 12 is a chapter about spiritual warfare. And in Revelation 12, Satan attacks five different people. He goes after angels, he goes after the world, he goes after the church, he goes after Israel, and he goes after Jesus. Read it, read it, it's right there. It starts in heaven with the fall of a third of the angels into hell. Then there's a fight with Michael the archangel, and then the world, and then the battle against God's people, the brethren, the church. And one of the most powerful verses in Revelation 12 is for us that are facing this battle on earth is Revelation 12, 11. Listen to these words. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. The word of their testimony. That's the ending. That's the, that's the part that tells the story. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. But I have to tell you, you can't quote this verse without giving attention to the two verses before it. Revelation 12, right before the blood of the lamb, is as if the writer John gives us what's coming. As Peter was saying to them in 1 Peter 1, he says, listen, I want you to be sprinkled with that blood of Christ because of what's coming your way. And how the apostle John is writing this and he says, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation, the power and the kingdom of God, of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren 
has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. Do you know what I kept seeing in this? Is to think, talk about spiritual warfare that we're facing. Did you see he gives us five names of hell, of Satan that comes against us? Look at this. He calls him the great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, Satan, and the accuser of the brethren. All in that, just two verses. He says, he puts it all in. And folks, I think this is important to understand that hell releases this flood against us. I have, thinking of that flood that's coming in from hell, think of those words. Satan, devil, accuser of the brethren, the great dragon, the old serpent. My goodness. I'm going, one of those names is enough. I don't need five different types of names. I'm going, and some people will try to delineate, which I, I don't see any problem. He says the great dragon is the mystery. It's the thing that, I, I, but I, it's no time to go through that. But I have a thought that I've been wrestling with because I, because I, as I'm, I said, God, I, I've never preached on pleading the blood of Jesus. I said, this is my first time doing anything like this. But here's what I realized. I think there's some things that I'm starting to become clear. It's this verse. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I love that verse. But here's the part I've always wondered. What's the standard? What's the standard? I mean, we didn't, it was all like, when the enemy comes in, like, well, the Spirit of the Lord will lift. I'm going, okay, but what is he lifting up? I'm going, what's the standard? Can I just tell you? Revelation 12 looks like a flood to me. Satan, serpent, devil, accuser, dragon. Could it be that the standard that's lifted high against this last day's onslaught is a joyful army of saints who know the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and we don't have a standard anymore. We have all this stuff. Could it actually be that the standard, or let me say it to you like this. This is the thought I had. When the floods of hell comes against us, there is a fountain filled with blood. <laughs> when, when floods come, I'm going to the fountain that's filled with blood. I'm finding that that fountain. And that's why he says, listen to the verse. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, word of their testimony, didn't love their life when they faced death. And for this reason, he says, oh, heavens, and you who dwell in them, I want you to rejoice. You've got the blood. You've got the name of Jesus. You've got a story to tell. I'm going to break shackles. I'm going to protect. I'm going to give you a new day, and I'm going to set you free, and God is going to do it. Folks, let me just tell you this. That's my standard. When the enemy comes in like a flood, I'm going, the blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. The blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. The blood of Jesus is against you. Now, I have to say this. I, 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 I'm just telling you. People don't want to hear this kind of stuff today. They want to be told how to be a good leader and they want to tell you how to, how to have date night. I'm sorry. We, we, I feel so impelled to say, I, we got to stay protected in these last days. There's a flood coming. So if you drive a Harley, God bless you. But don't come here for it to get blessed. You can drive it here. I don't care. But I'm just telling you, I, I, I want the blood. I don't need, I, I want the blood of Jesus. I want the name of Jesus. I want, I want that to be it. I know I'm going to, listen, I don't care anymore. I really don't. So. So let me say this, because I have to say this, and I know I'm going to get a hit for it. I know, I know, I know letters are going to come in and all this stuff, because you're, 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 you're taking a stand. Everybody's afraid. It's like, okay, let me say this. Okay. I'm saying it to all of you. I don't think it's by any accident. The original Teen Challenge director from the, from Brooklyn Teen Challenge, the original Brooklyn Teen Challenge that Brother Dave started so good to have our directors here, the Burks, so good to see Delaware Team Challenge here that, that are with us today. What a blessing, that, that ministry that was started by our founder. 
1973, the U.S. government came to David Wilkerson and Teen Challenge because they were astonished at the results of the Teen Challenge program. 1973, the best government drug program saw less than 10% stay clean after a year, and they couldn't understand how 86% of Teen Challenge graduates would stay free from addiction after a year. They couldn't understand it. They did a seven-year study. The government, or the United States government, sent in their, their, all of their people to do a seven-year study and found it's all true. They did, they did it. They did all, and it's, in fact, it's written, it's, it's there in D.C. And this is what the government said. We, and Brother Dave, I've heard Brother Dave tell this. We will fund every team. There's no, there's no, there's no qualms. This is a success rate. We will, we will fund every Teen Challenge program. We will give you, you never have to ask for money ever again if you staff every one of them with a government psychiatrist. That's what they told him. That's what Brother Dave said. And Brother Dave said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. He said, we are trusting God to set people free. We're believing God to do that. I don't know where everybody stands, and it doesn't matter. I'm telling you where we stand. Today, the battle ensues again. There is a civil war to try to bring Teen Challenge back into this. And around the country, Teen Challenge programs are being faced with what they call a medical model, which is giving, which is saying, and and it's the same battle. Listen, you, you post whatever you want. Take the clips, whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. Listen, listen to me. And what they're saying is, will give you synthetic drugs to get people off of drugs. That's what they're saying now. And and they're saying, we'll give you insurance money so you don't have to charge anybody. You don't have to raise money. We'll give you insurance money. Folks, listen. It's man's deliverance. It's man's deliverance. There's no need then to pray for miracles instead of the blood of Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Man is wanting to put their fingerprints on on the deliverance. And I'm here to tell you today, I believe that God is still enough to set a, a person free. I believe God is still enough to set them free. The blood of Jesus is enough to save, protect, break chains, give a new heart, and give a testimony. There's no testimony going, I took a synthetic drug and now I'm free. No, 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 no. It is God broke the bondage. God came and set me free. There is no, there is no testimony then. It has to be the blood. It has to be the Holy Spirit. It has to be the power of the name of Jesus. That's the only thing that can set us free. Give us a story and bring a testimony to God. That's how it starts. Here it comes. Quote me, post me, tweet me. God, get the glory on this. Stand with me. Make no qualms. I believe in the power of Jesus. Make no mistake. It's still the blood of Jesus. The blood still prevails. Still prevails. You're here today. You have bondage. You don't need a synthetic drug. You need Jesus. Oh, you shouldn't say that. I said it. I said it. The blood is enough. The Jesus is enough. He can set free today. He can set free. Oh, come on. Let's let's Sing it. Oh, the blood. Come on, lift your hands. That Jesus shed for me. Come on, lift them high if you believe in the blood oh, of Jesus. God, way back on hell. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. The blood. Yes, God. That gives me strength.
going, I need freedom. I need a new day, a new start. I need a testimony. The enemy is holding me bondage. I need it over my home, my family, my marriage. Lift those hands right now. And I want you to begin, not as a formula, just lift those hands. That's you. And just go, I plead the blood of Jesus over my home. Just tell him right now. I plead the blood, not as a formula, not as a superstition. I plead the blood of Jesus. Tell him, I plead it over my daughter. I plead it over my son. I plead it over my family. I plead it over my health, my body. Put the blood of Jesus over our doorpost. We're going up higher. We're going higher. We're going higher. Higher than a constitution. We don't plead the fifth. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. Come on, ask him right now. Tell him you plead the blood. Get used to saying those words. Come on, choir. Get used to saying that. Say, I plead the blood. I plead the blood over that choir. I plead the blood over the musicians. I plead the blood of Jesus over this house. I plead the blood of Jesus over our families. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead your blood. Hallelujah. For salvation, for protection, for a new start and a new testimony. Oh God, crush every one of man's gods that he has set up and set back up the blood of Jesus again. The blood of Jesus again. We believe in the blood. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, it reaches. Come on, church. It reaches. close today if you're here today and you just go pastor Tim I need a new start I ask you the question of the whole hymn and it just says are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb that blood can wash away your sins right now you don't have to bow your head you have to close your eyes I've tried everything else. I thought a marriage would help me. Having a child would help me. I thought going to nightclubs would help me. I thought doing this, having money would help me, having things. And you're watching, you're watching man's 10 things all get annihilated. And it finally comes back to this. I need God today. I need Jesus today. Balcony, main floor, watching around the world. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I need God in my life. I need God. I've tried everything else, and I need God. I need him to break the chains. Set me free. Save me. Here it comes. Save me. Deliver me. Give me a new start and a testimony to tell. That's what I'm asking for. Everybody looking around balcony, main floor, annex, watching from Jersey campus and around the world. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I want that. I want God in my life. If that's you without any head, hold up your hand. Say, pray for me. Just pray for me. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. Keep them up high. Yes, 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 yes. All these hands. All these hands right there. Keep them up. Yes. Got you there. Yes. All the way in the back. Yes. Balcony. Let me see those hands. Yes, 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 yes. Whole bunch in the balcony. Yes. All the way back there. Got you all the way up there. All of this. Come on. Let's pray this together. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, now say this loud and listen close. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The heaven is now my home. And I'm covered by the blood. 
in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen.